Hong Kong, the fragrant harbor. After a century and a half of British rule, China regained control of the city in 1997. The bustling metropolis plays a unique role in the Asian landscape. We are located in the center of Asia. Half of the world's population, that's 3.5 billion people, live within five hours of flight from Hong Kong. Hong Kong is the most vertical city in the world, and one of the densest. Seven million inhabitants, and no less than 7,000 skyscrapers. But an extremely efficient transit system helps manage it all. About 90% of the trips are made every day on public transport. Hub of international commerce, the city attracts people from just about everywhere. But doing business here means mastering the local culture. I think much more subtle is understanding the culture and the, the response that comes out of the context. More than 15 years after China gained control, Hong Kong remains a city in transition. And it's more exciting than ever. Hong Kong may be dense, but that doesn't mean it's an urban jungle bursting at the seams. Barely a century ago, it all resembled the small village of Tai O, located in the New Territories. Hong Kong Island is a very small island. The area across the harbor, Kowloon, was more part of the rest of China. But it just wasn't really a place that people had any reason to go to that often. Um, boats would pass by every now and then, but it, it wasn't, uh, certainly wasn't a large city like it is today. If you looked at pictures from when the British first got here, uh, not photographs obviously, but paintings, and you compare it today, I mean, they, you would have no way of ever thinking they were the same place. It was an island with small villages scattered around. Fishing villages, regular farming villages, agricultural villages, but certainly not, not a city. Why did the British take such an interest in Hong Kong? The British took an interest in Hong Kong because they needed a base to do trade in China. They had been in Canton for a while. Canton is what is known today as Guangzhou. But they weren't able to trade as much as they wanted to. They also were not able to have diplomatic recognition with China. In other words, they wanted to go straight up to Beijing to, to, to be recognized as diplomatic equals. The result was a war, the Opium War, uh, from 1839 to 1842. The story is pretty short. The Chinese lost, the British won. And one of the things that they got out of the war was Hong Kong Island. Uh, Hong Kong Island was given to them in perpetuity, forever. And then in 1860, there was another Opium War, and the British got Kowloon, which is the area across the harbor. And then in 1898, the British signed another treaty, this time without a war, and they got the area known as the New Territories, which includes what Lantau Island, where we are on today. Well, how did the retrocession happen if they were given Hong mm. Kong in perpetuity? Good question. Um, first of all, because the New Territories, or as the British say, the New Territories, was leased for 99 years. So that lease ended in 1997. Um, there was some talk about keeping the new territories um, and giving everything else back, but there's no way that that could have happened. And, and the fact of the matter is, in, by the 1990s, you really couldn't keep colonies. Um, even if I think the British could have kept it, I think it would have, it would have been a rather awkward thing to do. Uh, we also know, by the way, that uh, the, in 1967, there was a big riot in Hong Kong, or a series of riots, uh, left-wing uh, riots. And the British realized then, and this was during the Cultural Revolution in China, that Hong Kong was so vulnerable that it could never have been defended. So uh, we now know, we've only known this for about five years, that uh, in the late 60s, the British pretty much decided that Hong Kong would have to go back anyway.
rise of China on the world stage has increased Hong Kong's significance. But it was under British rule that the city began its phenomenal growth. When the British took over Hong Kong, it started to attract business people from all over the world. Uh, lots and lots of businesses, and they started building their warehouses to, to ship goods in and out of, out, out of China. And the rest is sort of history, as they say. Few people know that Hong Kong is more than just a dense urban area. In fact, I think about 40% of Hong Kong is rural. Uh, much of it is, in fact, natural. How many islands comprise Hong Kong? A lot. It's about 200 or so. Um, I mean, Hong Kong Island is the main island in terms of the business world. Uh, the Lantau, the island that we just left, is the biggest of the islands. It's uh, much bigger than Hong Kong Island itself. And then there are other islands like Ping Chau, Chang Tao, which means Long Island. And there are just a bunch of very small ones that you would ever, never have any reason to go. Most of the people who live on these islands are people whose families have been living there for several hundred years. Um, as you can see, they're still living a predominantly traditional lifestyle, farming, uh, fishing, and so on. So it, it depends on where you mean on, on some of the islands. One of the other islands, for example, Lama Island, is in fact uh, become much more uh, developed recently, and more people are moving there. There's so many small islands. There are no people living on there. Right. Do they, do, do they go? Oh, yeah, you can certainly go there. People often will, will rent a, a, what's called a junk, right? A traditional Chinese boat. You'll go there with your family, some friends, lunch, some beer, and you'll, you'll go out and spend the day in one of the islands. You can swim. Believe it or not, you used to actually be able to snorkel in Hong Kong. When I was a kid here, we did some fantastic snorkeling, where you'd basically go jump off the boat and then swim around, and you'd see all kinds of fish. Uh, you don't see much of that anymore just because of the pollution, but you can definitely get out to some of these islands with a boat. Do you think that these islands are going to be developed? I doubt it. I doubt it. Most of these islands, I think, have been developed to the maximum that they will be. There is some talk now about developing part of Lama Island, but I'm not quite sure what will happen there. Certainly, as soon as British people arrived in the 1840s, they started describing it as a highly densely populated place. When I was a kid, it was about 4 million people. Now it's 7 million people, and it felt crowded even when it was four million people. I'm not sure if it feels necessarily more crowded now than it did then, precisely because they've been able to move people out into areas where they couldn't live before. Hong Kong's population resides on only 25% of its territory. The mountainous terrain limits urban development, and space is so scarce that nearly a quarter of the city is built on landfill. Well, it started very quickly. It started in the maybe around the 1860s, and it began in the area, I think that is today central, and went all the way down to the east side toward what is today's Wan Chai. Much of Hong Kong Island, certainly much of the business area, uh, used to be water. I mean, the area today, central district, for example, the prime business area was water back then. The site of the new airport, it's entirely reclaimed land? Entirely reclaimed land, yep. yep. The harbor has changed so many times with all the land reclamation projects that they don't really have a proper harbor right now. No, I, I think that's a good way of putting it. If you really want to get a sense of how much the harbor has changed, um, it would be to have taken the Star Ferry several years ago and take it again today. The ferry ride itself takes less time than it used to. And we sometimes joke that within a few more years you'll be able to walk across, across. the ferry <laughs> because it's be, uh, across the harbor because it's gotten so small. What is the importance of the Port of Hong Kong? The reason the British wanted Hong Kong in the first place was because it, 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 its harbor, which is always described in books as its famously deep harbor, uh, compared to, say, Macau, which has a, a harbor but is extremely shallow and not very good for, for bringing in large boats. So Hong so Kong is a natural port? It is a natural port. Well, the whole point for taking Hong Kong, at least according to the British, was to have a place from which you could do business into China. Um, and even after the Opium War in uh, 1842, when China was open to trade, you still wanted a place that would always be reliable. Uh, so that was one of the good reasons for, for having a place like Hong Kong. And you could always ship goods into China easily, and just as importantly, maybe more importantly, get goods out of China. So it's always been a place where, where East and West have kind of come together. And I don't think that's necessarily changed, although it's also now important as a place where mainland China and the rest of the world come together as well. And it's also a place where Hong Kong and the mainland are coming together much more actively than before 1997. The economic potential here, first seen by the British, still shapes and defines Hong Kong today. It is the hub of Asian commerce and the bridge between China and the rest of the world. 
It's a city with many contrasts. It really is a hub where Eastern and Western cultures meet and business opportunities are created. Since 97, we have a very large number of expatriates from around the world and, of course, many people from mainland China have settled here. So on one side, there are foreign companies who come to Hong Kong in order to have an access to the Chinese market. There are nearly 7,000 foreign companies operating here, with a hub for international business in Hong Kong. And on the other side, we also see many Chinese companies using Hong Kong as a door to the rest of the world. Activity between Hong Kong and mainland China is bustling. Every day, crossings are made by 800 ships, 100 flights, 35 trains, and 27,000 vehicles. We are located in the center of Asia. Half of the world's population, that's 3.5 billion people, live within five hours of flight from Hong Kong. For business, it has an incredible potential. With China's growing economy, which will surpass the U.S. market, it offers extraordinary opportunities. In Hong Kong, we are really fortunate to benefit from this movement. We use common law, which is exactly like in Canada or the United States. We protect intellectual property. The Hong Kong dollar is a currency that is accepted throughout the world, and customs are different from China's. This is the freest market in the world. For business, there is no import duty and no value-added tax. This is a free port, where people can do business as they want. Legal business, of course. This is the freest market in the world. The local economic system is the epitome of free market capitalism and attracts investors from all continents and industries. If you don't know Hong Kong, you may think it's a city made only for large international companies. But in fact, it's a hub for private small and medium companies, for startups, for entrepreneurs. The tax rate is 16.7% for companies who move here, and it's 15% for personal income tax, which makes it very, very attractive for companies, as well as for individuals. It's certainly an attractive marketplace for investors. Hong Kong has always acted as the interpreter between China and the West, helping break down cultural and social barriers. But it has its own unique set of cultural rules that must be understood by outsiders wishing to access the world's most vivid economy. We moved here in 89 and we've been here ever since, 23 years. It changes you. I think all the expats that move here, they all say the same thing. It's congested, it's polluted, it's exciting, it's a great business, it's boom and bust, but uh, it's really a wonderful experience. What was it like to open up a business here? Easy. The easiest place in the world is to do it in Hong Kong. Almost everybody you see has a business. So you can buy a, a company off the shelf in a matter of minutes. And after that, you have to make it work. But low tax, very easy to make it work. But you can go out of business very fast too. So if you look in the newspapers, there's five or six pages of bankruptcies every day. It's sort of the pure capitalist playground. So you can win and lose equally. But for entrepreneurs, it's very good because if you keep practicing, you keep winning, which is also good. There's a lot to learn in Asia. Some of the things you would need to learn, the obvious ones you hear about a lot, when people say uh, yes, it doesn't mean yes, I agree, it means yes, I hear you. Pretty much everyone knows that. I think what's more, much more subtle is understanding the culture and the, the response that comes out of the context is really telling. But if you don't understand the cultural context, you don't know what they're talking about. So, for example, they may 
uh, in a meeting, uh, want to give you some ideas on how to improve your project idea. Uh, but they may not be comfortable with the way you, as the leader, it, are asking them. And so they may prefer to tell you over tea after work. But if you don't create that opportunity to talk about the project over tea or beer after work, you'll never get the feedback. Because they'll assume that maybe you don't want to know. And they don't want to offend, because it's a very conflict-diverse culture, and, and they don't want to create any misfeelings. So you may never get that feedback. Like many places, but probably more so here, a lot is based on trust and uh, on personal relationships rather than on contracts. It is. It's all about that. For example, uh, I was doing some work with a client in Indonesia, and he said, Peter, I, I signed this contract. I didn't even know what it meant. You know, I'm not a lawyer, and it's all in uh, very legal ease in English, and English was the second language. He said, I trusted the guy I was doing business with, but now the currency is worth one-sixth of what it used to be worth, and I can't respect the contract, so what should I do? And then I turn to the Western party and I say, are you going to continue business in this country? Yes or no, obviously you are, so forget the contract. You've got a great relationship. If you break the relationship, you're not going to do business with them anymore. So a lot of companies that pull out when things get bad, and break the relationship, struggle to come back in. Is it a very hierarchical society? Uh, yes, a very hierarchical society. And so much so that you may never get to talk to the boss in your own company. Uh, you would not be expected to be able to address him or her unless you were invited to do so. So it's not only hier hierarchical in terms of the grade or the master pay scale, it's hierarchical in terms of where people sit, where people are allowed to take the elevator, the rooms you would use to eat in if there's a staff cafeteria, the toilets they go to. It's, there's all sorts of ways of making that hierarchy very visible. And, and it's also a reward. So when you get promoted, then you get certain uh, perks, which are not entitled to people below your rank. So it's, it's, uh, it's an important part of social uh, cohesion, I think, in, in Hong Kong. How many different levels are there? Some of the organizations I've worked with have over 50 levels in the ranking of their employees. And in the West, you would find many organizations are under 10 levels. So that's a big difference. And it's, a, it's something that foreigners have to get used to because uh, if you're trying to engage a conversation uh, with people above your level, uh, it's difficult because they may not speak to you if your card doesn't have the same level title as their card. There is another fundamental element of social relations here that has risen to the level of a national sport, the exchange of business cards. Business cards are important. They're important for a few reasons. Uh, obviously, the information on them is important, but also the way you exchange them is important. So let's look at an example. I'm going to give you my business card. And if I was uh, uh, doing this in Canada, where I started business, I would just hand it over. I might just go like this. But here, very different, right? So here, we're going to hand it face up with the language facing to the recipient my two thumbs on top and I'll hand it and I will receive yours at the same time. So you have to start with two hands? Two th so it's thumbs up, two hands. Okay. Okay. And often what we hear about in the press is, is how you give it. And I think how you give it's important, but how you receive it's even more important. So on receiving somebody else's business card, it's important to take the time to actually read it. I don't want to just put it in my pocket. You don't want to just <laughs> put it in your pocket or drop it on the table or say, oh, thanks, and then move to the next item on the agenda. You actually read it, you look at it, you remember the name, but you ask some questions about what's on the face of the card and maybe turn it over because usually both sides of the card are important. There might be English on one side, Chinese on another, or it might be a bilingual face of the card and the back tells more about the businesses or the company name. 
So let's give it a go. Okay, so they really read into it, right? Um, so, uh, what does the A stand for in your name? Oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, I'm not often asked that question uh, because here a lot of the Hong Kong Chinese will focus on my Chinese name and they'll ask about the middle character in my Chinese name. And the middle character in my English name stands for Andrew. They'll zero in on the Chinese name. And then they'll ask them, the characters chosen for foreigners in China uh, is important because we foreigners don't normally choose the characters for our Chinese name. It's usually chosen by someone else. So then a whole story can begin about who chose your name, why did they choose your name, what does it mean? Many Chinese will interpret the characters a little bit differently. So then there's a discussion about what they think it means, and then so, they'll talk amongst themselves. So business cards is a way of getting to know each other. It's a way of getting to know each other, and it's a nice excuse for asking personal questions that can start to uncover important issues that will later become important in the relationship if you do business together. Cheers. So cheers, we would say in English, and in Chinese, what would we say? Kampui. Kampui. <laughs> Among the many nuances that must be grasped to understand the city is the ancient art of feng shui. This Chinese discipline encourages well-being through the channeling of energy from the environment. Here, almost everyone consults their personal feng shui master. Majority of the people live in apartments. At this moment, because the, I've got two daughters, I'm looking for a good apartment. But in my perspective, the size is important, but the good feng shui elements is also very important. Uh, I don't want to buy that, but the feng shui master said, this is the best house for you. Your feng shui master found your house? Uh, I have got about five, six different ones, and he go and look at it, and then he said, seriously, this is the best one for you. So, uh, no, although it's small, it's expensive, I just took it. Feng Shui seems to be a big part of life here in Hong Kong, but people don't seem to want to talk about it. Uh, seriously, yes. I mean, if you ask anybody, is it say, oh, have your house done Feng Shui before? Everybody will say no, because if, they, if your next door neighbors have seen you done Feng Shui, they will think, oh, something bad is happening to me. They will put something right in front of the house and counterfeit back. You put a mirror, they put a mirror, I put a fork, he put a knife, <laughs> I put my underpants, you put her underpants, and, and all the kind of things. We don't do it anymore. I mean, as discreet as possible, nobody sees it, and that's why you'll be peace and harmony. For reasons of discretion, after Denny's feng shui master advised him to display a mouse on his door, he wisely chose to put up a picture of Mickey Mouse. My feng shui master said basically is that the world is turning. So therefore, energy comes in. There are good energy and there are bad energy. So how to maximize the good and how to minimize the bad. So what changes did he make to your house? Uh, first of all, I have to put these golden things here. The clock over there is golden color on the side. It's for the feng shui purposes. The golden color in my house basically into enhance the richness, the good elements. While the red color in my house is to stop all the evil and bad energy coming in. Like for instance, these kind of red colors over there. It's only red on this side. So even my, my little espresso machine, which I love, I have to cover it. <laughs> I mean, I can never put red on this side. From the provided information, the feng shui master creates a chart that acts as a blueprint for all the decisions, big and small, one has to make on a daily basis. My feng shui master determined this year the colors I can wear. Two years ago, I can only wear yellow. That's it, only yellow. So I look like, a, my, my wife always laugh at me and say, hey, look like a banana is coming, the banana <laughs> is coming. We do it day to day life, but if I don't tell anybody, nobody realizes. It's like my mobile number. Your master told you what numbers you need? Yes, what combination it is. I go to many, many shops about something like, God knows. 10, 12 shops, different companies. And I said, okay, I want this combination. If you have this combination, call me. And uh, it took me good six months. It sounds like getting good feng shui is very time consuming. It is. If you expect that a feng shui master come to your house and say something is good for your life, it won't work. It will never work. Of course, each year you do minor changes. Like last year, I won't have any gold color on my air conditioners. 
Last year, this was not here. Last year, this was not here. What percentage of the population of Hong Kong do you think believe in Feng Shui? So seriously, even the expats in Hong Kong believes in Feng Shui. Uh, my mothers, my two sisters, and uh, I remember when my brother is living in the States, Washington, and my mother insists that he took a video of the house around, everything, and for the Feng Shui master to see and tell him what to do. But Feng Shui isn't only for the individual. It is also widely believed to contribute to the economic prosperity of the city. Even the state acts on its principles. Hong Kong's planning department offers financial and material compensation to residents whose feng shui is disturbed by surrounding construction. The importance of feng shui in Hong Kong is undeniable, but the layout of the city is also shaped by much more pragmatic concerns. In Hong Kong, you buy a house, have a perfect harbor view, great. A few years later, somebody is going to build something right in front of you and block you. This is, Hong Kong is like this. Hong Kong Shanghai Bank is the only building that has signed a contract with the government. Nothing higher than HSBC Bank building can build in front of HSBC. I remember the bank opening ceremony is at 2 o'clock in the morning. The Feng Shui master said, it's like this. <laughs> and they open it, I mean, 2 o'clock in the morning, they have the lion dance and dragon dance and jaw sticks, everything. And afterwards, I mean, people went back to this, behind the desk, sit there for, about half an hour, very, very sleepy, and then went back home and start over the same morning. I, I have to say, feng shui is really a part of everyday people. With dense pockets of population spread out over multiple islands, you'd think getting from point A to point B would be a challenge. Yet things run so smoothly that it's hard to believe that more than 11 million people use public transit every day. Transport is part of urbanism, you know, the construction of roadworks and how you deal with transport and how you deal with pedestrian capacity is, has a major impact on how people experience the city. Is Hong Kong a very walkable city? If you take the American measurement for walkability, which means you don't need a car, Hong Kong is very walkable. You got a fantastic public transport, and it's easy to get everywhere. Most people live within 400, 500 meters from public transport. About 90% of the trips are made every day on public transport. Uh, That's the highest in the world, isn't it? And it's pretty much the highest in the world. Yeah, I mean, people don't use private cars here. Uh, it's a very dense city. Our underground railway is a very profitable entity uh, because there's so many people using it all the time. There's so many people living on top of each line. It's a very efficient system. Since all these modes of transportation are operated by independent companies, Hong Kong has simplified the traveler's life by developing a universal payment system. The Octopus Card has proven so effective, it's now used to pay for almost anything in the city. It's just a stored value card. You can top it almost up anywhere, and you can use it on any transport. It's also used for discounts, so if you switch over between one transport and another, then this will recognize that you've used the other one, and it'll give you the discount on the next one. I heard you can use it at fast food restaurants, uh, ATM machines. That's right. Taxis now will accept this too. Um, so it's great. It's a very efficient system. Hong Kong is now exporting the technology to the rest of the world. Hong Kong has developed an extensive ferry system. 27 main lines and 78 secondary itineraries in smaller boats called Kaito cover the territory. Even the iconic Star Ferry, now mostly a tourist attraction, may be poised for a renaissance. Now, I think later on, when they fixed up all the waterfronts of Victoria Harbour, then the Star Ferry will come back alive in terms of people that are using it because then you're on the waterfront. You want to go to the other waterfront, so you grab a ferry. Rather than walking back to the MTR station, arriving at the Yom station and walking back to another waterfront, you will take the ferry to get across from one place to another place. This elevated network goes all the way through many of the buildings here in Central. You can stay at this level and then 
walk through shopping malls, corridors, walkways, and, and connect. It's really convenient because when it rains, when you're cold, when you're hot, when hot. then it's great. You can just be indoors and use the facilities. And the good thing about Central is you have that choice. You could be at ground level, be dropped off with your car, or you grab your taxi, and you can take the underground network too. There's uh, Pretty much up to that building over there is a massive underground network that goes all the way through Central that you can walk. If you want to be efficient and you know the area, you know exactly when to walk by the upper, when to walk by the ground level, when to grab something on the ground. One of the good things about our transport is the Airport Express train. You know, you arrive here in the middle of Central and you grab the train 20 minutes later you're right at the checking counters at the airport. Same floor? Same floor, and then you're straight into customs, and you're into the, um, you're gonna go up to your plane. So, extremely convenient. They build that very well integrated, that's unique. Not only does this ingenious system ensure speedy travel to the airport, it also lets passengers register at either of the two inner city departure points. Hong Kongers are transport whizzes. Uh, well, I guess you got so much density, uh, you got so many, uh, you got so much traffic, you got so many people you got to move around in very small areas that uh, they had to be very creative in finding solutions for it. But there is uh, a problem with this as well. If you push all the people off the ground on this level, is that you forget to make the street level better if, and then it, the street becomes more and more hostile to the point that people may not want even want to be there anymore you're relegated as a person to all this kind of uh, commercial domains so there is an end to this game it's not always good it's good if there's choice you could choose to be at the street level but what they tend to do is once they got a network elevated they remove the street crossings but what is the point of having everybody raise the level the key driver is to try to separate the, the pedestrians from their cars. Make sure that pedestrians don't impede on the vehicular flow. Make sure that cars can move more, so you have more capacity for getting cars through. The best way to do it is getting the pedestrians off the ground, so you don't have to have pedestrian crossings to slow down the traffic. So high density has a lot of uh, good things it's in terms of, uh, you know, a very efficient MTR system and a subway system, very good public transport but you also lose a lot. But you see, the moment you have the smaller streets, no longer the big roads, then people are at street level because all the shop entrances, the office entrances, all the activities is at street level. So now below here, we got an MCR. So not only do we have multiple <laughs> layers of transport all going through the same city where you have subway and street level and elevated level, even the, the buses and the trams themselves are double-decker too. It's all to get that capacity needed for this high-density city. The high cost of cars and the taxes that come with it explain why so many people choose public transit. To make life easier in the city's countless hills, a network of escalators almost a kilometer in length carries more than 60,000 people every day. 20 years ago, there was this discussion of how to solve it. This escalator, I don't know how old is it, about 15 years, 10, 15 years is old. Um, and they decided to build it because it's Hong Kong is too so crowded. You can't get more vehicles in the roads. I mean, look at here. Um, but you got more and more people living in middle levels because they continue to increase the height of the buildings. So to transport people, they needed new solutions. And one of the solutions that they came up with was building this massive escalator up the mountain. And it has really transformed the entire neighborhood. The property values have shot up on the side of this escalator. Look at that, how the, how this, we've got even elevated bars here, coffee shops. There's all these activities taking place, there's all these multiple levels, basically addressing the, the people that are coming up here with the escalator, creating a complete new economy. Who's in charge of all these different transportation systems? Usually what they try to do with this kind of project is try to find a private developer or a private operator by giving them development rights on top of the stations. And that will finance the construction. But it also helps to get the patrons that use the train. So by building on top of the stations to get your density there, uh, you basically get your daily flow of people that are using it, that spend money and, and defer the costs. 
and the, uh, the money from developing the property goes into building your railway. So it's been a very efficient model in the new territories. That's how they've been built. They plan a railway station and a town as one. But the disadvantage is that it can sometimes be very inflexible. If you want to provide a bus service in an area where there are not many people living, you're not going to get a bus service there to be, because it's not profitable. The other one is, of course, where's the limit? You know, at some stage, there is only so much space at street level. It's always been growing, more land reclaimed, buildings higher and higher. But when is it going to say, this is it, this is full, My, this area is full, I can't go bigger. And that's, that's a question that the city has to answer. Based in Hong Kong, journalist Andrew Willis has an up-close view of the forces that are transforming the city. I first moved here because I wanted to study business. Uh, I thought it was the ideal hub for business. Uh, it seemed like everything was moving fast, it was dynamic uh, and exciting. And uh, The big experiment in laissez-faire capitalism? Exactly, exactly, and it very much has been that. Um, you, you never know what's going to happen. Uh, there's things popping up everywhere. It's, it's, it's the land of opportunity. And you have a Chinese girlfriend? I do, I do. Well, she's actually Hong Kong. She'll make sure she uh, <laughs> specifies this. But yes, uh, she is local. So um, you can't call a Hong Kong or Chinese? No. In fact, when I first came out here, I was telling people that I was going to China, and, and you know, most of the Western folk were like, yeah, that's cool, you know, great. Uh, when I told that to someone from Hong Kong, they were very quick to correct me and make sure that I was going to be with Hong Kongers, you know, I was going to Hong Kong uh, specifically. What was the reaction of Hong Kongers to the retro session? When 97 was coming along, uh, a lot of people uh, did become quite nervous about uh, the handover. They were worried about what they helped build with the British government would be taken away from them. They were worried that they would lose their democracy. And they were worried that the true one country, two systems wouldn't materialize. By definition, the one country, two systems is basically put in place to preserve Hong Kong as it was left by the British in 1997. Until 2047, in 50 years time, it means that the government of Hong Kong has, an, has some independence from China. That's what it comes down to. How much has Hong Kong changed since 1997? If you ask any local, they're, they're probably going to tell you that there's been a major influx of Chinese immigrants. This has probably always been the case, in fact. However, these days, it's much more prominent. We're seeing a much higher volume of immigrants come from mainland China. And this is this more so falls in, into the theme of the silent influence from the Beijing government. I heard there is a huge influx of women coming to give birth here. That's right, and that is a very hot issue right now. The mainland mothers are coming into Hong Kong, giving birth. What's happening is that their children become Hong Kong citizens with all the rights attached. And because of this as well, because it's their children, they also get additional rights from this as well. Um, by proxy, their, their parents uh, have a lot more leverage when it comes to staying in Hong Kong. The government's trying to control this, so they've tightened up regulations because there were complaints about there not being enough resources for local mothers to give birth. So what's happening now is that mainland mothers are coming in and they're giving birth in the emergency rooms. And this puts a, a major strain on the entire health system in that case. Is 2047 coming too quickly? It is coming too quickly. Many of the changes that were supposed to come in 2047 are already happening now. And they're happening through bilateral agreements between Hong Kong and China. Often China will give Hong Kong a benefit that may help them. But very soon after, China will reciprocate for a, with a benefit that further involves, that further influences, that further implicates the, the Chinese presence into Hong Kong, that further shifts things towards becoming China. You're seeing China come into the picture from a point of a more positive influence on the city, uh, China as a big brother, Beijing's always operating in, in the background of Hong Kong. They never want to show their face directly. Um, by different, but since 1997, there's been a lot more uh, conspicuous 
presence. Aside from that, um, the, the economy of Hong Kong has become a lot more China-centric. I've heard many people say that they feel that Hong Kong is, is, is heading towards uh, becoming a second-tier Chinese city or that Hong Kong is going to be replaced by Shanghai as, a, as the economic center of, of the East or, or as, as the economic representative of China towards the world. If the local Hong Kong government becomes too influenced by Beijing, then Hong Kong will head towards becoming a Chinese city and only a Chinese city. During the colonization, the Hong Kong identity began to develop but I think only after 1997, people began to piece together what makes a Hong Konger different from other countries and what makes Hong Kong its own nation in that regard. What are some of the customs that make Hong Kongers unique? Uh, a lot of the customs that Hong Kongers hold dearly to themselves are customs that perhaps originated from having to deal with a high density of people. They're customs that, that deal with uh, uh, how to how to get along and how to cooperate with each other um, in, in, a, in a very compressed environment. Um, these are customs around being polite. They're customs about uh, you know not being too loud in public. They're customs about queuing, about keeping a good line. Customs about not spitting. This is something that they take very seriously. In fact. Insider's perspective on Hong Kong, Andrew takes me to the narrow streets hidden between the epic skyscrapers to meet his girlfriend Carol. Carol, Heidi. Hi, Heidi, how Carol. are you? Nice, nice to, meet you. to meet you. How has Hong Kong changed since 1997? Basically, a lot of things are changing. Like, for example, some of the languages are like changing. They're introducing more Mandarin. And there are more and more mainlanders coming every day. They issue pass for like 150 mainlanders to come into Hong Kong every day. So since 1997, there have been around 1 million people pushing into Hong Kong already. Do you think that after the handover, after 1997, the Hong Kong people became a lot more aware of their own culture that they had. Yes. Yeah. We're uh, so afraid that we're going to disappear right away. What are you worried about losing? I mean, all the freedom of, of uh, press and all the freedom of uh, speech. We have our own like special languages that changes from time to time. And because it's also different from Mandarin, which is the official language of China, so we can express and communicate a lot of different things in like, Cantonese that cannot be found in Mandarin. I think everybody here is very proud of being able to speak Cantonese. In fact, the Chinese government has already introduced some measures to uh, reduce the, the amount of Cantonese that's spoken in the mainland provinces. We, we say ourselves as Hong Kongers instead of like Chinese. It's because some things that are done in China that we're not very proud of and we kind of want to separate ourselves from them. And for example, the food safety incidents. For example, they have like fake eggs and maybe fake soy sauce. And it's kind of more guaranteed that the food is more safe here. I think what makes Hong Kong so special from a, a food point of view is the fact that it's so diverse and it's such a blend of international and Chinese and Southeast Asian and Asian food all together in one. So you're going to stay at least another four years? Yeah, at least for the food, you know. A model of efficiency, Hong Kong keeps its residents on the move. Less time in traffic means more time being productive. The blistering explosion of commerce in this part of the world could easily create chaos. But daily doses of feng shui wisdom help keep the calm. The future is bright for this jewel of commerce, a true bridge between East and West.